Okay, maybe we can start. So, um, let's start uh, with questions from last time. Do you have any questions from last time? Um, okay, if you don't have any questions, I'll, I'll answer some questions that were asked uh, to me after the lecture. Um, so, uh, one question is why are these divergences local? Um, so the divergences of entanglement and entropy of a region, why are they local? So that's uh, related to the fact that um, in quantum field theory, recall that uh, correlators at very short distances blow up. So it means there is a lot of entanglement at short distances. And so when we divide the region into two, the divergences are coming purely from the short range entanglement between points or degrees of freedom in this side of the surface and degrees of freedom in the other side of the surface. So from that point of view, we expect that uh, the diversion parts of the entropy should uh, depend only on what's going on uh, very close to the, to the surface, right? And should be expressed as integrals over the whole surface. Um, okay. Um, another, uh, another question is, uh, suppose you had a, a scalar field in a uh, free scalar field in a Rindler space. Um, what can we say about uh, the density matrix? So recall that we wrote the density matrix as e to the minus 2 pi <coughs> times uh, the boost generator. And um, so if we have a scalar field, can we give a more explicit uh, description of this density matrix? What exactly is it? So uh, you can uh, consider the wave equation in uh, Rindler Right, so we have some scalar field. It will obey a certain uh, wave equation. Um, and you could uh, divide the field in modes. And you could, let's say, in two dimensions, you could organize the modes according to their uh, frequency according in Rindler time. So you do a separation of variables uh, using the Rindler frequency as uh, your basic variable. And in that case, uh, you will find that uh, the density matrix will be a product of the density matrices for each uh, mode. So for each frequency, we have a harmonic oscillator. And for that harmonic oscillator, we have uh, the density matrix of corresponding density matrix for a harmonic oscillator, which is um, sum over n of the various occupation numbers of those modes of uh, n, n times e to the minus um, uh, well, 2 pi omega n, okay, which are the energies of the corresponding oscillators. So we have this sum, and then we have the product for all uh, the various modes. That's a slightly more explicit form of the density matrix. Um, okay. Now, uh, let's raise this. Um, yesterday I, I used this uh, Cardi formula, uh, so I, I wonder how many of you would you like uh, some explanation of uh, where that's derived from? Um, how many would prefer to skip the explanation? Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a sketch of the explanation together with some sketch of things in uh, two-dimensional field theory, conformal field theory. So uh, everything I'll say now will apply to uh, two dimensions, or one plus one dimensions. But we'll uh, first consider two Euclidean dimensions. Um, so then uh, in two dimensions, the stress tensor has uh, basically, in a generic theory, three components. The in light concordinates, dx plus, dx minus, or in Euclidean space, we could write the metric as dc, dc bar. Um, so then uh, the stress tensor will have components uh, plus plus, plus minus, uh, and that's equal to t plus minus. The stress tensor is symmetric, so it will be equal to t minus plus, and t minus minus. And this particular one is the trace of the stress tensor. So, in, uh, so this one is actually also equal well, we could write it as t mu mu. Okay. So in a in a scale invariant uh, theory, uh, in a 
yeah, so this uh, we expect that the well we we find that the stress trace of the stress tensor is zero. Um, and well, more precisely, if it was only scale invariant, it is not not quite zero, but it's divergence, and then you prove that it actually has to be zero. Uh, but uh, so in uh, two dimensions, scale invariance implies conformal invariance, and then uh, if uh, the theory is conformal invariant, the trace of the stress tensor will be zero. Um, okay, so that's uh, what we have. And now, if we look at the two point function of uh, the stress tensor, uh, okay, before, before doing that, we can say we have uh, the conservation of the stress tensor, so d mu, uh, d mu nu equal to zero, right? And then we can write it down in this uh, sort of like on coordinates. So uh, we have the minus uh, d plus plus, let's say, plus d plus d um, minus plus equal to zero, right? So here we took nu to be the plus index, and then we wrote down this expression. But in a conformal field theory, this uh, operator itself is zero. Um, therefore, uh, this operator depends only on x plus, right? So this depends only on x plus and has uh, no dependence on x minus, okay? And similarly, for t minus minus, will depend only on x minus. Right? Sometimes this is written in terms of c, and c so this is uh, equivalent to saying that uh, in Euclidean space that t c c depends only on c, so it's a holomorphic uh, function of c, right? Uh, this is both true classically and quantum mechanically, so we will have an operator which is a holomorphic function of C. Right? And this has uh, many, many consequences which I won't uh, be discussing. Um, but in particular, we can uh, ask what is the two point function of the operator, and yesterday I briefly discussed that. So if we write down the two point function of. Uh, the t plus plus operator at two uh, points, let's say uh, x plus and x plus prime, right? Now we said it has to be a function of only x plus. Uh, translation symmetry implies a function of x plus minus x mi uh, prime plus. And then scaling, which is the fact that we, we can rescale all coordinates. The Stress tensor is uh, an energy density, so it has units of energy divided by length. That's the same as units of energy square or dimension two. Okay, and uh, therefore this whole thing should have dimension four, so it should be a function um, x plus minus x prime plus square to the fourth power times some number, which we are going to call c. There are some factors of two here. Sometimes I think this is defined with a two. I will ignore all factors of two and pi in this discussion. Um, now, so that's uh, the two-point function. Now, this, in particular, this two-point function um, cannot be zero because of uh, reflection positivity. So if, um, if you are in Euclidean space, um, um, so if, yeah. The point is that uh, there's a property in uh, quantum field theory that um, a local operator cannot annihilate the vacuum. So if you have a local operator that uh, annihilates the vacuum, it has to be uh, essentially zero. And now you might be surprised by this property because, uh, I mean, an operator like the annihilation operator A annihilates the vacuum. But this is uh, not a local operator. This is the integral over space of a uh, local operator. So then uh, if you consider the two-point function Euclidean signature reflected in Euclidean time, uh, so we know it cannot be zero. And furthermore, uh, it has to be uh, positive, OK? Um, because this can be viewed as the inner product of two states. So the state that we get by doing Euclidean evolution up to here and then the state that we get during Euclidean evolution. Well, and the state here is just the reflection of this one, so it's exactly the same state. And that, that can be viewed as the norm of that particular state. And so this has to be positive. So C is bigger than zero, some number bigger than zero. Um, OK, so now um, uh, 
Now let's try to uh, check uh, this equation that we had over there, that d minus d plus plus is zero. So now we take the d minus of, uh, with respect to, let's say this, let me call this x and this x. Let me set this to zero, so to have a slightly. Um, so let's take uh, d minus of uh, d plus plus, um, of, uh, well, of this correlator, right? So we take the minus of the correlator that appears here. And you might naively say that that's zero, right? But we need to be uh, a little more careful, because um, let's consider the function 1 over x plus, right? Um, and we're going to ask whether d minus of 1 over x plus, do you think that this is zero or not? What? Yeah, so uh, this is supposed to be a delta function, right? Or derivative, uh, yeah. So this is a delta function, delta square of x, right? So it's delta of x plus times delta of x minus, okay? Now, um, why is that? So we can think of 1 over x plus as uh, d plus of, let's say, the log, for example, of modulus of x, uh, of x plus x minus. Um, and if we think about it this way, then uh, this is like saying like the Laplacian times the logarithm of x, which and the logarithm, recall, is the inverse of the Laplacian in two dimensions. That's a delta function. Right? Um, alternatively, we can think in terms of a contour integral. I mean, this type of um, so this is the gradient of another gradient. So we could take a contour integral, and due to the presence of the pole, um, um, the, that uh, will have to contain this delta function. So Anyway, so that there is this delta function, and so what that is saying is that it is fine to think of x as holomorphic as long as x is not quite uh, on top of the other point. And the equation, so if we apply, if we take this derivative, then that equation, uh, so the equation d minus of t plus plus equal to zero is not obeyed. So it's obeyed as long as x is different from the insertion of this operator, but if we ask about the point where uh, x plus uh, is equal to 0, um, then it will uh, not be obeyed. Therefore, we will have to add, uh, so that that is, we could fix that if we say that t minus minus, um, so OK, le let me say what this is. So, that, uh, so we said that the derivative of 1 over x plus is the delta function. So this is a delta square of x. Um, and uh, and uh, here, but here we have uh, three more derivatives of x plus. So this is d plus cubed of uh, delta squared. Okay. And uh, now let's postulate that uh, this correlator, x plus x minus, is equal to uh, delta squared um, of x plus x minus mm, d plus uh, square d minus. Okay. So uh, let me see if I got everything correct. Um, so what we want is that uh, when we um, uh, when we take d plus of this quantity, right, which is what appears there, uh, we should get uh, exactly the same as uh, we were getting here. Um, so yeah, so what we, I forget about this d minus. So what, uh, what? Yeah, sure. Um, so what I'm saying is I'm uh, we're trying to fix up this uh, word identity here that comes from something very fundamental like the conservation of stress tensor. Right? In order to fix it, we are going to add a contact term in the two-point function. So contact term means a term which uh, is only non-vanishing when the two operators are overlapping, right? Um, so it will be some delta function. And uh, because of the plus indices, it has to have this extra derivative. And now the dimensions work and so on. So it has to be something of this form. Um, and we're going to adjust the coefficient. So here we had the coefficient c. We're going to adjust the coefficient in such a way that that, that equation is obeyed. So the left. Um, so the top part is uh, the 
this term here, uh, we have d minus d plus, and so if we take d plus of this, uh, which is what we get here in uh, this term of the equation, uh, we see that we can make the equation of a if we put a factor of c. Forget about the minus signs, I'm not... Uh, okay, this derivation, as I said, it, there will be a minus sign here. But, um, you can check all the signs uh, yourselves if you want. If you really want to understand it, then... Normally, if you want to really understand something, you need to understand all two and minus signs and so on, and then you really understand it. Um, so this is just a sketch. Um, OK, so what is uh, this sign? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, so if we have this derivative, then we get the delta cube. That's correct. And then they cancel, right? And indeed, then we remove one of the derivatives. Then we have this expression. And now we'll uh, see what this expression implies. Ah, it erased. Yes, yeah, sir. Well, good. Yeah, so it's, uh, all the twos are important in this. <laughs> <laughs> to, to really understand it, yeah. Uh, OK, so now what we will do is we will um, so consider this to be x prime, right? Uh, so this is now x minus x prime. And then uh, we multiply by, uh, let's say, some small function g plus plus of uh, x. So the stress tensor is what results from doing a small change in the metric. And then we integrate d square of x prime, right? So if we do this integral, then uh, what we get is we here multiply by the same function and so on. And what we end up getting is something of the form c uh, times um, times uh, d plus squared of uh, delta g plus plus. Okay. Um, and then we could also have a similar thing with uh, minus minus, and we'll get also another expression with we will add to this the minus minus. And this expression, um, this expression can be viewed as the linearized uh, curvature. So this is some expression, and uh, if you take the metric of flat space and you make a small deviation of the metric, um, you can ask uh, what kind of invariant tensor this is. Um, and it turns out that it is the uh, small variation of the curvature. In other words, uh, if we put the field here in a curved background, what we'll find is that uh, the expectation value of t mu mu, or t plus plus, is going to be equal to uh, the central charge times the curvature. Again, I'm not uh, keeping track of this, the num numerical factors. So. Here, all we derived was uh, the expression, just the linearized expression around flat space. And from this, and uh, saying that, well, whatever this trace is, it should be a local expression in terms of uh, a lo local expression uh, in terms of the background space. Uh, so here, what we're imagining is that we put in the field theory on some curved background and with some generic metric, g mu nu, two dimensional metric, g mu nu. And then uh, we get. Uh, that the trace, uh, which naively would be zero, and it is almost zero because it's just uh, a C number, so it's not an operator in the theory, right? It depends on the metric of the space, but the metric is a parameter of the field theory. It's not uh, an operator in the field theory. So the trace is just this, uh, this curvature, okay? And, um, right, so, uh, this is sometimes called the conformal anomaly equation. So, because one might have naively expected t mu nu, the trace of t to be zero, but it's not quite zero. There is some small dependence in the theory. In, there is some small scale dependence uh, of the theory. So, naively, one would have thought that if you take a metric and you uh, change the metric, let's say one plus uh, delta uh, some some function, we rescale the metric just slightly. Uh, by a small quantity, um, then uh, one would have expected that um, to get exactly the same partition function, for example. But uh, this equation is saying that we are not going to get the same partition function, but that there will be a change in the partition function that will be proportional. Yeah, I should write bigger. Uh, delta of log of c, uh, which uh, will be will involve this uh, the integral of the delta omega, so the change in the scale factor. Uh, times the curvature of the original metric, right? Okay. 
times some factor of c. Um, and you can view this as uh, saying that, well, when we, regul when we define the theory, we'll need to regularize, and we'll need to subtract some divergences. And uh, there is some residual dependence of the scale factor of the metric in this attraction. So typically, you'll have logarithmic divergences. You subtract something that diverges, but you'll get some, uh, some still f finite dependence on the scale factor of the metric. But the dependence is simple. It's just in a, in a C number that depends only on the metric, not on the fields of the theory. Here, I haven't mentioned any operator of the field theory, only the external metric. OK. Um, so this is what happens under a small change. And if we, uh, we can sort of integrate uh, this equation uh, and consider a finite change, so what happens when we go from g mu nu to uh, e to the 2 omega uh, g mu nu, right? Um, or maybe, um, let me call this uh, g mu nu hat so it's clear what we're doing. Um, so then uh, the idea is that the uh, ratio of the two partition functions, or the, the difference in the log of the two partition functions, uh, is going to, well, we can get it by uh, integrating this equation. Um, and, um, and we get that. Um, is equal to c times uh, the integral of the gradient of omega. So this, all these gradients are with respect to uh, this metric here, uh, plus some term of the form omega. OK, and this is uh, sometimes called the Liouville action, um, though it's sometimes it should be called the Polyakov action. But and the Polyakov action should be called something like the Nambu action. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so we are not going to remember the name. So this is uh, something that was uh, derived by Polyakov. Um, anyway, I'm, so now uh, there is something interesting uh, here, um, which uh, it's going to relate the stress tensors um, computed with respect to the metric G. So let's say that we define the stress tensor uh, with respect to the original metric G. Um, and that's going to be equal to uh, the now the stress tensor. So now we can take the derivative, the functional derivative, with respect to the metric, and there will be a contribution from taking the derivative with respect to the metric g hat here. Um, um, so for on one hand uh, we have just the usual stress tensor defined in terms of the metric g, and on the other hand uh, we have the stress tensor of let's say the Liouville part. Um, uh, which uh, is, uh, will involve d mu uh, omega. So let's say around flat space is just uh, uh, going to be an expression. So let, let me just consider only one component of the stress tensor. Um, so it's going to be something of the form d plus omega square plus uh, d plus square of omega. And this, comes, this second term comes from this term here. Um, and then we have the d plus plus in terms of the metric g hat. Okay. So this is just the stress tensor measured or with the theory renormalized with the metric G. Um, and we can compute it in, uh, in any coordinate system and so on, transforms uh, appropriately under coordinate transformations. And it's equal to uh, this expression uh, in terms of the other metric. So now uh, it's uh, interesting to consider a situation where uh, we have two metrics, one um, so let's, um, let's see, I guess perhaps we'll do it in Euclidean space. Um, so let's consider, um, on one hand, a uh, flat space metric, d c d c squared. Um, and on the other hand, let's write c equal to e to the omega, right? So it's an exponential map. Um, so this original metric is equal to the metric e to the omega plus omega bar, d omega the omega bar, right? So this metric is the analog now of the metric uh, G, right? The, the one in the left-hand side. And this will be uh, what we were calling e to the 2 omega, OK? So this is a map that maps the plane to the cylinder. So let me be a little more 
precise. This is very closely, this is almost closely related to what we're doing with Rinder space before. Uh, so we have the plane C, right? And then uh, something, so the, the variable W, so if we just change the imaginary part of W, we are going to move uh, along circles here in the C plane, okay? So this, uh, this metric here has some translation symmetries in W that correspond to um, scales and rotations of the original uh, metric. Um, okay, very good. So then, uh, so the original, we have, let's say we had the vacuum in the original space. So in the C coordinates, we just have, we have the Minkowski vacuum, and we renormalize the stress tensor so that T is equal to zero. The expectation value of T is equal to zero in that vacuum. Um, so T C C is equal to zero, right? But now uh, we come back uh, to this expression, and we, um, well, I guess now we're using variable C. Um, and now we just evaluate this. So notice that omega is just linear in this variable, so something with a second derivative will drop out. And here I should really put omega. Um, um, so something with the second derivative will drop out. And so we only get uh, this term. Um, and, um, and that's just a constant, right? So um, this is omega is just uh, omega is simply omega plus omega bar over 2. So these derivatives are just a constant. And I'm not keeping f track of factors of 2. Um, and uh, so we get uh, some expression of the form um, C, uh, some constant, and then T, W, W. OK? Um, and this is the stress tensor measured with respect to the metric G hat, which is the, just the metric DW w bar, OK? Um, so here uh, we have a metric, which is the metric of a cylinder. Um, so this is the, let's say, real part of w. And this direction is the imaginary part of w, right? It's a cylinder because uh, the, the imaginary part of w um, was this rotation coordinate here in the c variable, right? And was periodic, right? Goes from 0 to 2 pi. So here uh, we have the metric of a Euclidean cylinder. Um, and we are getting that the stress tensor on the cylinder uh, measured with respect to the flat metric on the cylinder, so with the theory renormalized with the flat metric on the cylinder, uh, is some constant, right? Um, and so that's, uh, so this right-hand side can be viewed as uh, the CFT uh, at uh, finite temperature. Right, some temperature which is uh, two pi in this case. Okay, and this is telling us how much uh, the stress tensor, how much the energy is, the expectation value of the energy is in the energy density is at that particular temperature. Right, so this is telling us that the expectation value of the energy at the temperature two pi is uh, goes like C. And if we now uh, we want the energy density at some other temperature. How do we restore the factors of temperature? Imagine we computed everything with the proper numerical coefficient so far. How do we restore the factors of temperatures for generic temperatures? So now consider a cylinder that has a generic temperature beta. Right? What should we put here? Huh? Yeah, the dimensions. Dimension analysis, right? How many powers of the temperature do we expect here? Right. So we'll get a factor like this, right? So a factor like this would give us, give us the general dependence, right? Just by scaling. Once we computed the proper factor here, and the, the proper factor can be computed by doing this whole thing with all the numerical factors. And I think yesterday I, I quoted the right uh, factor. Well, I quoted the right factor for the entropy density. So once you have the energy density, you can compute the entropy density. And yesterday I quoted a, a factor for entropy per unit length, or entropy density. Uh, which was 2 pi t um, times uh, c over 6, OK? Um, OK, that's, uh, that's so far. That's the Cardi discussion. Um, now, another, another thing that is usually uh, said in this context um, 
is uh, so this computation uh, can uh, also be viewed as a computation. So, if we, so what we said so far, we were viewing this direction as Euclidean time. Uh, but we could also view this direction as Euclidean time, and this direction as a compact spatial circle. And then the same, exactly the same discussion now uh, has the interpretation of the calculation of the Casimir energy on a circle. So we have uh, the quantum field theory, which in flat space had, um, let's say, zero energy density. We put it on a circle. Due to the fact that we put it on the circle, there will be a non-zero energy on the circle. And that uh, energy on the circle, um, again, will be proportional to C. So it will be some factor of C. Um, and when you uh, think about it uh, properly, so for a circle of uh, radius 2 pi, this factor is uh, C over 12, okay, with a minus sign. So that's, again, a generic, uh, a generic answer. Uh, for any CFT, mm. once we do this. Uh, so in two dimensions, there are many quantities that are governed by uh, this number, the central charge. Um, the reason it's called central charge, I didn't explain. Uh, it's related to the fact that uh, there is the Virasoro algebra, and uh, this number appears in the Virasoro algebra in a way that it commutes with, so it's just a constant, it commutes with all the other uh, generators. and. That's why it's called central, um, and it's called charge because it's some extra number. You could think of it as having some different eigenvalues on different theories, but normally we just think of it as a C number. Uh, um, okay, so that's. Uh, are there any questions about this? Uh, one over there. Yeah, that I said it was for a circle of uh, radius two pi, of size two pi. But indeed, uh, if it has a generic size r, then we have r. Or R is, yeah. So in the same way that we uh, got the behavior for for any, um, so that was for, for size uh, 2 pi, right? And then if we have any other beta, we have 2 pi divided by beta, right? Beta is the size of the circle, right? Uh, uh, that's the total energy, yeah. Um, should Very good. So now, um, we said all this, and recall that last time we had derived the formula. Um, so based on uh, essentially this formula, we derived the formula for the entanglement entropy of an interval. So if we have a 2D CFT, and uh, we have an interval, uh, then um, um, yeah, so to, to be honest, the, the things that I've said so far are for theories where C left is equal to C right. So to get there, the curvature, we assume that C left was equal to C right, if you know what that means. That means the coefficient that appears in T plus plus is equal to the one that appears in T minus minus. Um, and I'll only discuss such cases. Um, so we derived the formula for the entropy of the interval, which was C over 3 times the log of uh, the UV cutoff divided by the size of the interval. Right? Um, okay, so that was this case. So now uh, let's. Uh, so what I'm going to start discussing now is an application of this entanglement entropy ideas to derive a so-called C theorem. So um, a C theorem is uh, a theorem that says that a certain quantity uh, decreases under the normalization group flow, so that if it's larger in the ultraviolet than in the infrared. Um, and in this context, it was uh, originally. Uh, such a th C theorem was dis uh, described originally by Samolochikov, where he defined the function C. So, oh, sorry, the, the, first of all, the C theorem is uh, useful when you are doing non conformal theories. So, in a conformal theory, the, that quantity C that you define is constant, it's like the central charge, doesn't depend on scale, it's just a number. But when uh, you um, are considering theories uh, which are not conformal, that flow between a ultraviolet fixed point, conformal field theory in the ultraviolet, and an infrared, let's say, conformal field theory, um, then it should decrease, right? It should be less in the infrared than in the ultraviolet. And then you have to define this quantity C. Um, and well, Samologikov gave some definition in terms of the two-point functions of the th these uh, various components of the stress tensors. So there are three components of the stress tensors in a non-conformal theory, and you can define it in that, in that way. 
and then use the, the reflect both reflection positivity and this condition to derive an inequality. Um, so now we are going to do the same, but using entanglement entropy. But we're going to define the, the function we're going to define is going to be slightly different than the one Samologikov defined. Um, what I'm going to discuss now was done by Cassini and Huerta, and um, it's a uh, it's a little nicer in the sense that it's a more direct connection to the number of degrees of freedom. The intuition is that as you go from the ultraviolet to the infrared, you should the number of degrees of freedom should decrease, the number of fields should somehow decrease, and the question is whether this is uh, true or not. Right? Um, so that's in relativistic quantum field theories. We expect that the measure of the number of fields, which uh, in the two dimensions a good measure seems to be this C, it appears everywhere, so we'll take it to be a measure of the number of degrees of freedom. Um, and uh, uh, maybe I should have said that, uh, for example, for, for one real scalar field, uh, C is one, or one uh, Majorana fermion, C is equal to a half, um, and then you can have all kinds of theories with various values of C. But anyway, so now uh, we're going to do a non-conformal theory. Let's imagine that not this non-conformal theory has a ultraviolet fixed point. So let's imagine that in that theory, so it's a, again a 1 plus 1 dimensional theory, and we are going to compute the entanglement entropy of an interval of length L. Okay. Now, what do you expect the diversion part of this entropy to be? So this, uh, there will be a cutoff. There will be some terms that will be divergent coming from the endpoints of the interval. Um, do we expect the power of epsilon or a log of epsilon? Log. What do you think the coefficient will be? So this is a CFT that in the ultraviolet, at very short, this is a non-conformal theory, then in the ultraviolet has um, uh, an ultraviolet fixed point. So an example of such a theory would be a real scalar field with a mass, for example. So at very short distances, it is as if it was massless. Long distances, we have some mass. Yeah, so here we'll have C U V over 3, right? And then um, there, here there could be some uh, generic function of the of L, right? We don't know what. So before we knew what the function was, it was just this log of L. But now that it's not conformal, uh, we don't know what it is. Okay. Now we're going to define some uh, C of uh, L. So this is uh, going to be our uh, C function. Uh, we're going to prove it has the property of a C function later, but it's going to be a function, um, and we're going to define it in terms of this entanglement entropy as uh, in such a way that we get rid of these diversions, and a good definition is to say that this is 3L um, dL of um, S of L, right? So if we define it this way, uh, so this is just a definition, but the only thing uh, at this point, I want to point out is that if we define it this way, the divergence drops out. Okay, so we're comparing the entanglement entropy for, let's say, an interval of some length with entanglement entropy with uh, an interval of a slightly different length. So this is an example where, when we uh, look at a useful function that will be useful for something, the ultraviolet divergences will drop out, and you will typically want to describe them to to consider such functions. Um, and of course, this is just 3 L DL of F, this function F. Um, okay, so now uh, one can derive. Uh, I'll, I'll show you the derivation in a second, but let me just first state the result that DL of C of L uh, is less or equal than 0. Okay? And this will follow from Lorentz invariance. And uh, some entropy, some entropy inequalities. So, if you call, if you want to say it's unitarity in the end. I mean, it's the fact that all these entropies come from density matrices, which are positive, uh, positive definite. I mean, positive matrices. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll tell you the derivation in a second. But uh, first, one thing I forgot to mention 
is that if you have a conformal field theory uh, where f of l is this uh, log of l, right? So uh, using this uh, definition, you um, you will get uh, that this c is uh, this um, this constant that we have over here, right? Um, did I mess up the sign? Um, I probably messed up the sign. Okay. Yeah. Der deriving that is um, that it decreases when it has the wrong sign, that would be bad. Um, um, okay, so... Yes? Uh, the one I wrote over there? Yeah, yeah that's the, to the total entropy of this interval, the von Neumann entropy of this interval, which uh, in this case that we are starting with the vacuum uh, is just the entanglement entropy of this interval, right? So, um, so this is dimensionless? Yes, yes, it's dimensionless. So here, this can be an arbitrary function of L because there could be other scales in the problem, like the mass. So in this example that we discussed with the mass, massive field, there would be some mass here, and then, well, L times M mass. And then, uh, yeah. Um, well, it's minus log L, right? Well, how many? Well, you can check what the correct sign is. Ah, that's why I had the wrong sign. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I was worried about this sign because the inequality was working correctly with this sign. <laughs> oh. I was I was going to have to find another mistake in the rest of the derivation, which I was getting worried about that. Huh. So these are mistakes just, just to make sure that you're paying attention. <laughs> um. OK, so the argument is uh, very nice. And uh, it uh, considers, so let's consider, so we have the Lycon, right? And so let's say, let's say this is x minus, and this is x plus. And so let's consider, so this is 1 and 1 here, right? Um, so let's consider this interval, right? That's uh, one interval we could consider. Its length is equal to uh, the square root of x plus x minus, right? So we are going to consider here various intervals, and their lengths are going to be the product of uh, x plus x minus. So, um, so if we have an interval that uh, ends at some generic uh, position of this kind, so the length, for example, of this interval, um, will be equal to the square root of x plus x minus. Okay. Um, and good. Now, when we consider uh, the entanglement entropy of an interval like this, we could also consider a boosted interval such as uh, this interval, right? And the entanglement entropy associated to this interval will be a function purely of the length of the proper length of this interval. Um, which uh, in this case is just uh, the square root of um, um, of x plus, right? Well, x minus is uh, one, right? Um, okay, very good. So now we'll um, uh, so we'll consider in this argument this uh, various intervals. So one uh, will be this interval here, um, and we're going to calculate the entanglement entropies for the various intervals and compute, consider a particular entanglement inequality. Yeah, I mean, let's see. Uh, let's write it here. Well, let me let me erase this formula. Uh, so the inequality we are going to consider uh, is called uh, strong subadditivity. Strong subadditivity. Uh, 
Okay. Um, and it says that if you consider the entanglement entropy of uh, so strong solidity is a is a it's uh, an inequality that involves three regions, so regions A, uh, B, and C, okay? And, um, and so we are considering the entropy of um, A union B union C plus the entropy of C is less or equal than the entropy of A union C plus entropy of B union C, okay? And so this is not so easy to prove for density matrices. And um, it was proven by Liev and Ruskai. Um, and it, it's, it can be proven not so, with not much difficulty from the monotonicity of relative entropy also. So those two are the hard, uh, the hard ones to prove. Um, but if you prove one, you can prove the other. Um, and um, yeah, so that's uh, the basic uh, one we are saying. But you can think it's plausible by thinking about A, B, and C, right? Um, and then imagine that you have, uh, so you have pairs which are entangled across A and C. And you can have things which are entangled between A and C, or between C and the rest, right? So you can consider a situation of this kind. And uh, you can, by counting lines, you can uh, easily see that uh, this is going to be obeyed, OK? Um, and um, if you don't have these kinds of lines, you, uh, this uh, will be saturated in this picture. Um, you can consider lines where you entangle all three of them, and then it will not be saturated. But anyway, so you'll, um, you can make this plausible in this way, but to find a mathematical, a correct mathematical Proof is a little more difficult, but it can be done, and it's not—it's not infinitely long, but it's not very intuitive. At least I didn't, I didn't find it intuitive, intuitive enough to remember it. Um, okay, so now uh, we are going to um, be considering the. Um, um, we're going to be considering these various intervals, and we'll think of uh, this interval as C. Okay, so this uh, interval here would be C. Um, we can think of this guy as A, and so the entanglement of, uh, more precisely, then we're going to consider this whole interval as A union C, okay? And then similarly, this could be viewed as B. B, B we don't really need, so don't worry too much that this is lilac, right? What we are really using is uh, what B union C is. So this is B union C. This is some other uh, interval. And, um, and then uh, if we consider the whole thing, then this is A union B union C. That, that's the top interval. Okay. Um, so S, S is a function of L, right? Um, and just to make uh, the argument somewhat simple, so imagine that this is at the point e to the delta, and this is at point uh, also e to the delta, right? So this is at 1, and this is e to the delta. Delta will be small. Um, and, um, and so these entropies are a function of L. And so we'll get uh, here um, s of uh, e to the delta, because it's the product of this times that square root, so that's e to the delta. Um, this is the entanglement entropy of an interval of length 1, OK? Um, and this is less or equal than the uh, entropy of uh, an interval of length e to the L, delta over 2, plus s of uh, e to the delta over 2, right? OK? Um, so that's uh, what we derived so far. So this is the. Um, this came from essentially unitarity of the theory and the positivity of the density matrices. Here, uh, in this formula, when we uh, wrote these particular dependencies on uh, the position of the endpoints of the intervals, we use uh, Lorentz symmetry right, to calculate uh, how, this, how the entropy depends on the size of the interval. And now uh, we are almost done, so we can uh, 
if you wish, we can call this function, let's say, h of delta, right? Uh, let's call this uh, function of delta, h of delta. And um, so we now expand this function up to second order in delta. Uh, so this, this is going to be uh, h, this would be h of 0. Uh, and this would be h 2 times h of uh, delta over 2, right? And uh, now we expand to first, if we expand to first order, we'll get h prime here and h prime here, and they will cancel to first order. So, uh, and then we now expand to second order, and we get here h double prime delta square is less or equal than twice h double prime delta over 2 all squared. And this is equal to h double prime delta square over 2. And then, um, we end up with the condition that h double prime is less than 0, right? But what is derivative with respect to delta? Uh, so the derivative with respect to delta is the same as uh, L dl, OK? And therefore, uh, this function h prime is exactly the same as the function, uh, well, it's proportional up to a positive constant to the function c of L that we define over there, right? Recall the definition of C of L with the sign that you guys corrected. Um, you, you helped me figure out the correct sign there. And um, that function is exactly the same as uh, the first derivative of this H. Um, and now uh, the second derivative is uh, negative, which is the equality we wanted to prove, right? The inequality we wanted to prove. OK? So that's the end of the derivation. Um, Where Lorentz symmetry came in? Yeah. Lorentz symmetry came when we said that the, so first of all, we said that the entanglement entropy is a function purely of the proper length of the interval. So if we have an interval of this kind, uh, it's going to be, well, just the length. But before, we were considering purely spatial intervals. So the novelty here is to start considering these tilted intervals, right? So, um, and, um, and so when we consider uh, this other interval, the entanglement entropy associated to this interval is going to be proportional to the proper length of that interval. And we would go to another Lorentz frame where this is just a spatial interval, right? And in that Lorentz frame, the entanglement entropy is just the, is given by the same function that we had before of the length of the proper length of that interval. So that's where we use Lorentz symmetry. Um, OK. Now, this, this was extended to 2 plus 1 uh, dimensions. And so he, here, here one rederived the result that one knew before. Um, it's not exactly identical, because this function c is not the same, that the same function that uh, Samologikov defined. Um, but um, But well, it shows the utility of thinking about uh, these entanglement entropy ideas to derive, uh, let's say, theoretical results in, uh, in quantum field theory. And the same can be done in uh, 2 plus 1 dimensions. Uh, um, so in this case, uh, you consider the entanglement entropy in the vacuum. So the vacuum entanglement entropy. So the vac we have the vacuum, and we have a disk. So we, are, we have two spatial dimensions, so we consider a disk in those two spatial dimensions. And um, in, so here, um, what did you expect the diversion terms to be? <coughs> so here we said they were going to go like r over epsilon. And then there is uh, going to be something finite. Um, so in a non-conformal theory, this finite piece will depend on R. And in a conformal field theory, this just would, would be just a constant. Okay. Um, so here, uh, we, it's convenient to define a function f of R. Uh, so in, even in non-conformal theories, we can define an f of R, which is equal to R dr 
minus 1 times uh, this s of r. Right? So uh, if you have a term that is linear in r, such as uh, this term, uh, it will drop out from this expression because uh, r dr will give us this term back and the minus 1 will just remove it. Right? So this gets rid of the, this particular derivative operation, gets rid of the diversion terms in a way very similar to the one we used before. Um, and it lets us focus on the finite piece. Um, if um, this f, if we have a conformal field theory, so we just get rid of this term and we just get purely the finite piece. We get minus the finite piece. Okay? This uh, f of r would be minus the finite piece. Um, and it turns out that, uh, so there the argument is more complicated and I won't, uh, I won't discuss it, but you can argue that this f of r also decreases. So f of r decreases. Under the renormalization group flow. Um, so it's a more sophisticated argument, not with a, just a couple of intervals with an infinite number of uh, different spheres that are uh, all boosted relative to each other and so on. But, um, but it's the same, uh, conceptually, it's the same idea of using entropy inequalities and Lorentz symmetry. Um, now, uh, it turns out that this quantity is... Uh, uh, in three-dimensional field theory is related to uh, some other quantities in the same way that uh, the C function appears in various observables. Um, this uh, quantity F for a conformal field theory is uh, related to the S3 partition function. So if you take the partition function of the field theory on S3, right, um, then uh, this partition function is equal to e to the f. Okay, so for a conformal field theory, f just is a constant independent of r, and the partition function is just equal to that constant. Now, at this point, you might uh, you might worry that this partition function has divergences. So when you consider uh, the partition function on Euclidean S3 has divergences, but those divergences are local and have the form uh, one over let's say epsilon cube. Well, maybe I should write bigger good practice to write bigger and higher. Um, okay. So uh, the partition function of a field theory on S, uh, conformal field theory on S3 will have diversion terms that go like e to the integral over the volume square root of g times 1 over epsilon cube. And you could also have diversion terms that go like um, the integral of square root of g times the curvature of the sphere. Uh, and then we'll have this finite piece that is the one we were talking about. So the statement is that uh, we can unambiguously uh, separate these volume divergences and concentrate on this finite piece. Um, now, um, very good. So, why uh, are these uh, two things related, you might ask? Um, and um, so, um, sorry, I screwed up the sign here again. Well, we would have discovered it in the derivation. But. So, why are the two things related? So, we can think of S3, right? Uh, so we start with S3, and uh, we can uh, choose another conformal frame, uh, so do a rescaling of the metric, so that we go from S3 to H2 uh, times S1. Okay. Now, let's, uh, I could do this more explicitly. So suppose you had uh, the metric in um, these coordinates. Uh, What do we call this one? Uh, the okay. So that's just the metric of the sphere. And now to go to the metric of H2 times S1, we just divide everywhere by cosine, uh, cosine square theta. 
These two metrics d differ purely by a conformal factor. Um, okay. And so the partition functions uh, for the theory in, on S3 and the theory on H2 times S1 uh, are going to be related. Okay. Um, now we have to worry about conformal anomalies as we had to worry in two dimensions. However, in uh, three dimensions, you uh, do not have a conformal anomaly because when you um, take the trace of the stress tensor, um, the whatever appears here has to be a local expression. So a local expression in terms of the metric, for example, and the curvatures and so on. And uh, the, metrics, uh, the, met the curvature has dimension two and the Riemann tensor has dimension two. And so any contractions of the Riemann tensors and so on we can make will have even dimensions. So in odd dimensions, we don't get, um, we, there is nothing we can write down, and the theory is uh, also vile invariant, and there is no conformal anomaly. So things are simpler in odd dimensions. Um, okay, so uh, that's uh, so far, so these two things. Now, H2 times S1 uh, has the can be interpreted as um, as a thermal theory. Um, so the thermal theory on 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 H two. So you can think of S one as uh, a Euclidean time, and so then this is a, therm a, a theory at finite temperature, at temperature two pi, at beta equal to two pi um, on H two. Okay. And if we do that, then uh, we uh, find that uh, what we are calculating, this partition function, um, has, uh, can be viewed as e to the um, s minus beta times the energy, right? So that's the, just the free energy expression. Um, so that's s is the entropy of the theory on s h2, and e is the energy. So the energy can be computed in terms of the expectation value of the stress tensor on this space. Recall in two dimensions we computed the expectation value of the stress tensor after a Weyl transformation uh, by following using the conformal anomaly and so on. But here it's even simpler because um, there is no conformal anomaly. The expectation value of the stress tensor um, on uh, H2 times S1 is going to be zero because it was zero on S3. So one-point functions are zero on S3. Um, and so E is actually zero at this particular temperature. Of course, if you were to vary the radius, then E will have different value, and this, this will not be true. But at this particular temperature, the partition function is just the entropy. Um, now, this entropy is uh, also uh, essentially this entropy, because if we have uh, a circle, um, let's say, a, a circle in space um, is also related to um, H2 times S1. Um, so it's, it's also related to a thermal theory in H2. Um, maybe how well will I explain that? Um, should I explain it in detail? Yeah, I'll explain it in detail. Um, so, um, so a disk, so, so far, we what we've shown so far is that uh, the partition function on S3 is the same as the entropy on H2, right? Times S1 with period 2 pi. So that's what we've shown so far. Um, now, a question? No. Is there a question? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't the metric on S3? Well, I probably made a mistake. Let's see. No. No, I think it was the metric on S3, right? Well, the original metric on S3, well, S3 has three dimensions, right? So we have three coordinates, right? Um, so yeah, these are not uh, exactly the Euler angles, but you might be more familiar with, but they're simply related to the Euler angles. Um, but in order to understand the origin of this metric, is uh, convenient, so you you write the sphere, the three sphere, right? So then uh, psi is the angle between here and here, right? 
So you write x1 as so okay, but let's be very explicit. So x1 will be sine of theta times uh, cosine of psi, x2 will be sine of theta sine of psi, right? And so on. And the, these two, so the sum of these two squares, so this whole thing is going to be called sine square of theta, and this whole thing is going to be called cosine square of theta, right? And then the rest is clear. Very good. So, um, Now you know that um, by conformal, by just a conformal transformation, we can map the disk uh, to a plane, right? So the the disk can be mapped to a plane, and if you had the plane, so to the half space, so the disk, uh, since conformal transformations map the uh, circles to planes and so on, so we have that we will have a particular conformal transformation that maps this, so the interior of the disk, to a half space. Right, so this is the space. For example, so we have um, some coordinate. Um, let's call it um, anyway. So we have some coordinate. Uh, let me see. How are we choosing the coordinates? Yeah. Um, so we have let's say one spatial coordinate x, and then. Um, we have the Euclidean time coordinate, and then we have a third uh, coordinate, right? That goes uh, goes in this direction. So we can um, let's see what is most convenient here, um, right? And then uh, then we can use now the usual discussion that we were discussing before in Rindler, right? So there is um, so in this half space and Euclidean time, which is uh, Rindler coordinates, the R square plus um, R squared, d theta squared, right? This is not the same theta. The well, how would you call it? The alpha squared. Okay. So alpha is this coordinate, and then there is a third coordinate, which I'm going to call the x parallel, right? So that's uh, Rindler spaces, Rindler space plus the extra coordinate, and th those were useful coordinates for thinking about the half space. Um, and now we uh, can divide by R squared, and so uh, we just have these two divided by r squared plus the uh, alpha squared. And then this looks like the metric of h2. Right? And then this is uh, ds1 we were talking about. So what we did was to relate uh, the disk to the half space and then uh, do a while rescaling of the metric so that now we have h2 times s1. Okay. Um, and the original entropy we wanted to compute, well, what, what was it? It was the entanglement entropy that of the density matrix coming from the evolution in the angle alpha. Remember yesterday? We talked about that. Uh, and that translates into just the ordinary uh, thermal entropy in this situation. So it's the entropy we get by doing Euclidean evolution in this S1. Okay? We have no one conformal anomaly to worry about. So then this entropy is actually equal to the entropy we talked about here. Um, and in a conformal field theory, this finite piece defined with things defined this way is minus f. Um, and the diversion pieces are uh, not tracked through this argument, but the um, uh, the finite pieces are, and we get in the end that this was zero and s was e to the minus f, and that's the uh, relationship we wanted to prove. Okay. Um, now this f has uh, so the story here in um, in three plus one is slightly different than the one in one plus one. So in one plus one, this function c uh, appeared in the two point function of the stress tensor. Um, we don't know how to relate uh, f to correlators of the stress tensor. So if you take the two point function of the stress tensor, it's going to, you will have another another number there that is not uh, equal to f. Um, so here you only we only related these two quantities, and one nice feature is that uh, we this uh, partition function on S three in many supersymmetric theories can, is exactly computable. So in uh, three dimensional theories with at least n equal to two supersymmetry, there is a 
technique based on it's called supersymmetric localization that actually allows you to compute these partition functions. And so you can check this and you can see it's true. And in fact, the fact I mean the fact that this uh, was some kind of uh, f function was uh, conjectured uh, was conjectured before based on the explicit computations for uh, of this kind. Mm. Okay. Um, now, one thing you can worry about, wonder about is, uh, let me say one more thing related to, uh, to this. Um, so when you have this disk, um, well, this relationship between entropy and partition functions is uh, very general. I mean, it's uh, true in, a, in other dimensions also, but uh, in even dimensions, you have to worry about the conformal anomaly. In odd dimensions, it's essentially the same as what I said so far. Um, but it's not as calculable in other dimensions. Well, except in four dimensions where it's related to the A anomaly, which is also simple. Um, now we have uh, this disk, and you might wonder what the... So we had the, the killing vector, which... Um, yeah. So let's, what I'm trying to explain, what I'm going to try to explain now is the following. In Rinder space, we found that the density matrix was equal to the integral of a local, e to the integral of a local operator, right? e to the boost. Remember that formula? Uh, rho equal to e to the minus 2 pi b. Right? And <coughs> due to this uh, relationship, the same should be true uh, of the disk. And so I'd like now to give us more explicit discussion of what uh, exactly is the operator that appears in the disk case, right? So you can, so what is B? B is the is sum of the generators of the conformal group, right? So it's, uh, B is the integral of the stress tensor, uh, T mu nu times uh, particular conformal killing vectors. In this case, it's just uh, an ordinary killing vector. Um, the star of this is the current that they integrate on a spatial surface, right? So this is um, this is a conformal current, right? Current associated to the symmetry generated by zeta mu, uh, which in that case was uh, just the boost. Um, and here, yeah, maybe I should go through this a little more slowly. Um, so if you have a, a, a symmetry a conformal isometry generated by the killing vector uh, zeta mu, right? So for example, if you had a translation. Uh, zeta mu is just a constant, right? So you have a small change of variables, which is uh, so. So x mu goes to x mu plus delta mu, uh, delta x mu, and this is let's say some what we are defining as x mu. Um, let me just just write it like this, which in general could be a function of x, right? So for the case of uh, Translations that I'm using just a constant. So associated to any such symmetry, uh, there is a conserved current, j, uh, j mu, zeta. So it depends on the killing vector that you chose, conformal killing vector that you chose, and it's equal to um, j t mu nu zeta nu. Okay. So you can check uh, that this is conserved because you can heat it with d mu. Right, so we'll um, um, and well here the mu of t mu nu that uh, will give us um, will give us zero right by the by current conservation uh, by the stress tensor conservation. Um, now, um, of course, there is a term where d mu acts here and a term where d mu acts on the yeah maybe I should go through this more slowly d mu j mu equal to zero. So it would be a piece where, where, we're, where we'll get d mu of t mu nu, right? So, so there is this term, and then there is a term where we get t mu nu, d mu, zeta nu, right? Well, the indices uh, are contracted in the appropriate way. Um, let me just write this. OK. So uh, in this piece, this guy is zero because of the stress tensor conservation, right? And this one here 
Um, so if we have a conformal killing vector, then we know that d, d mu nu symmetrized is proportional to g mu nu or eta mu nu. So in the flat space case, it's proportional to eta mu nu with some function, some proportionality constant which could be a function. And well, of course, this function is nothing else than d sigma zeta sigma, right? Okay, so this piece is proportional to the metric, and uh, the trace of the stress tensor is zero in a conformal field theory, so then we'll uh, get that it's conserved current. Um, and that's uh, what we used there, and f this we can do for any generator of the conformal group. And what was the boost uh, generator in these coordinates after we did the conformal transformation to the half space? In uh, the original picture is some uh, conformal uh, killing vector that preserves the boundary of this disk. So it's some killing vector with that in Lorentzian signature uh, has an action of this form. So it preserves, it, it maps points inside the causal wedge to points inside the causal wedge. Um, and we can give it a very explicit expression. So C mu, um, C mu dx mu is equal to 1 over 2r. Um, R squared minus uh, the spatial coordinates minus the time coordinate. Let me, this is the Minkowski time coordinate in uh, in this text picture uh, times uh, dt. Um, minus two t x dx. Okay. Anyway, it's not too important to know exactly what it is. Uh, what's important is that you can write it down, and how we obtain it is by so if we think, well, we can just ask for what is the uh, conformal isometry that preserves the boundary of this disk, and we'll get just this one. Um, and, um, and then uh, you, we can now write uh, without, we can write now um, formula for the density matrix of uh, So before we wrote e to the e to the minus two pi b, right? And for this case of the disk, we can write similarly: rho is equal to e to the minus two pi times the integral over space over the disk. Let me call it uh, the spatial disk of uh, the star of t mu nu zeta nu, where t is the stress tensor of the field theory. Zeta nu is that killing vector that we wrote over there. Um, and of course, this is just the dual, so we'll the epsilon tensor. Um, so the important thing is that this is also a local operator in the field theory. So both the half space, uh, so this was Rindler. So Rindler has um, <coughs> a simple expression for the density matrix uh, for any field theory, conformal or not conformal, any Lorentz invariant uh, field theory. If it's not Lorentz invariant, then the thing doesn't work. But if it is Lorentz invariant, then it will have the simple form. And in the case of the disk, uh, it also has 